You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I am Tom Knezic. Welcome to episode 66. Oh, you know what? It is 66. (laughs) Yeah, I always try to update it for you, but I'm always throwing Tom curveballs because I I just forget to update it. I think it is updated, and uh, I just was getting one episode of Head of Ourselves. Because I think Buzz episodes are all odd number so yeah that would make sense but friend i want to start out with question this week okay and uh that question is who is your best friend and give it for you reasons why it's me (laughs) (laughs) wow that's a tough question you know tom you and i are good friends i don't know wow you know as an introvert i don't have very many close friends i have to say um Tom and I are very close so because we, we spend a lot of time together and we mm-hmm. we talk a lot about a lot of a lot of topics. Oh, yeah. If I had to go best friend, I have a friend Michael from high school that even though we may only get together once every five years, you know, we he was the best man in my first wedding. And if I were to have a best man in my upcoming wedding, it would probably be him. Oh, not, Again, not me. Not no, you. No, not no. you. It's- I, mean, I just want to point out I wasn't invited to your wedding. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> so, but you know, I would say even though we're not close today, we both have families. We live over an hour apart, but we we've, we've maintained to keep our friendship, you mm-hmm. know, for the last for the last thirty plus years. So I, I would have to say that it's it's hard though because I'm not super close with anyone. I'm I'm sure I'm probably upsetting a lot of people <laughs> by saying that, but I don't know how many people would say I'm their best friend. Yeah, well, I do know there's one knock against me, and uh, all right, and that's that I didn't provide a new drink this week. Oh, so you know what? That's... That didn't help you. I, I think last week you started a precedent where we started off the show drinking a, an alcoholic drink made from native plants, and today my cup is is kind of just only filled with with water, <laughs> and it's not quite this. I thought we were starting like a new. Like yeah, a, it was like a, a whole new norm. It was like, a tradition was of, be... uh, of one episode, and <laughs> that's I, that's probably where it's going to end. Maybe uh, we'll, maybe I'll come up with something else. We'll, when the paw paws are ripe, I'll figure something out. There's got to be some paw paw moonshine in our future. Yeah, yeah. So. I got to figure out how to make moonshine before I do uh, that. But <laughs> I wanted to ask that question because it's friends are important. The pandemic kind of proved that. Yes, the friends are really important. It's good to have that socialization. But there's other things that need your friends too, like animals and insects and and plants and um and even our parks and how was that for a segue man that is beautiful i was wondering where you were going with this and i kind of i like the flow so and that's where we've got a lot of questions recently about people wanted they don't have a lot of space in their own yards perhaps or they live in an apartment they live in a city but they have their local parks and uh and sometimes they don't necessarily love what they're seeing uh plan there it's either they're planning um invasive plants or, or what they might think is the wrong plants or they're planning uh, or they aren't maintaining it and they're letting invasives come in and that's where there's a lot of these groups that are popping up really all over the country that are doing such great work in our community parks and we wanted to highlight one of them today um really to kind of give a blueprint about how maybe you can do some of the stuff in your own park if they already have a friends group how you can influence that friends group or if they don't maybe you can start one so you're gonna say something friend no oh i thought you were cutting me off (laughs) no you're just so you're gun shy because i'm always cutting (laughs) everyone off i'm actually letting you let you talk You, you have me captivated yeah so with that i'm gonna introduce uh cynthia blackwood and beth beth i forgot to ask you how you pronounce your last name before we started and i'm a I'm terrible with last pronouncing any names, no matter how easy. Um, so it's, it's not. Just <laughs> pretend there's no you. <laughs> young, okay, young. And uh, and they're from Friends of High School Park, which uh, is just outside of Philadelphia. So Cynthia and Beth, why don't you introduce yourselves a little bit better than I did and uh, and really talk about High School Park and how this Friends group started. Thank you for the introduction. And um, I'm Cynthia Blackwood. But if you're still looking for wine berries and things like that, our, 
our meadow is so full of elderberries. Come on down. You can make your own wine again. <laughs> yeah. Um, See, Tom, you have no excuse. I, I know, feel like so much stuff to. Uh, here I am not I doing anything. I just want to be like served like a king. Yeah. The pawpaws haven't come in yet, but they'll be there too. So awesome. So I am the restoration park manager for Friends of High School Park, which is an 11 acre native three ecosystem park in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. And Beth, introduce yourself and then we'll go back to talking about the park. You're muted, Beth. Yes, my computer was not unmuted, sorry. Uh, thank you. I am uh, Beth Yant, and I was for several years the vice president of the park when Cynthia was the president, and I've been involved since about 2013. Okay, so your question was, tell us about uh, Friends of High School Park. So we are working on our 27th year and the reason that it's called High School Park is that it was the former site of Cheltenham High School and then Ogant's Junior High School and then Beth Jacobs Jewish Day School. So in 19, it was abandoned late 80s, early 90s, it burned down to the ground. Arson, don't exactly know the, the problem, but it was a huge fire. Then the community got together with the township. Township took control of the 11 acres. The small group, energetic group, decided let's, let's do something other than put up a McDonald's or an apartment complex. Let's turn this 11 acres into a native green space. The community um, was missing the gathering space that the high school and the various schools offered. You drop your kids off for school, you'd have some coffee in, in the area, and it, the, the community was missing that social action. So they got together in 1995. They, in conversation with Cheltenham Township, decided they would become a 501c3, applied for that, and was granted the status in May of 1995. Then they came to the 11 acres and said, oh my goodness, what do we need to do now? And they have to take out, they took out all of the trash, all of the leftover buildings, all of the, um, high school desks and the art supplies, everything was left. It was burned and, and it was a mess. So that took them quite a few years to get going on that. And then they started planting gardens. They started in, um, encouraging volunteers to come and form groups and work days started. And over these 27 years, we've developed the almost the entire 11 acre park into one meadow, two rain gardens, seven smaller gardens, a woodland um, edge on the hillside and stream bank. We, we're a little slow on the stream bank restoration, but the township will be helping us with that. Beth, go ahead and chime in. What did I forget? One of the things that's really important to note about the park is that Elkins Park is an older suburb and it's an entering suburb of Philadelphia. It's very dense and heavily developed and really built out to the extent that it can be. So when they're talking about development activities, it's always going to be infill. And what's critical about the park is that it's in a center of a community and around it, you see uh, businesses and uh, suburban homes uh, and apartments and developments that really don't have other green space where stormwater is, is able to infiltrate and where there's any kind of habitat for animals. So among a lot of fragments in these inner ring suburbs, you know, this represents an area that is it contains a park that has a large number of trees, it has several different intact ecosystems that are being actively maintained for their natural benefits and ecosystem services. So I think that's really a special thing about the park that people may not realize when they're just coming there for a walk or to play with their kids or to let their dog outside. So for our listeners, just to, to even go back a step further, for our listeners that don't know, what exactly is a friends group and how is a friends group formed? The Friends Group is a, a group of community. Actually, there's a road that uh, borders the, the 11 acres called Harrison Avenue. And so basically the 11 acres is that ba their backyard. 
So almost everyone who lived on that very small street got together and said, we need to be a group. We need to go to the township. We need to say we have a mission. We need to say we're going to accomplish A, B, and C. And that's how the friend group was established. So the, the land is actually owned by Cheltenham Township. So we are we do not own the land at all. We are simply the stewards of the land. So that, I guess, stewards of land is a definition of what a friends group is. They got together, filed for 501c3 status so we could accept donations, and then they went off with that. Stewards are, are most of the time one of the most important aspects because you could do all the restoration you want. If no one stewards it, there's nothing keeping it in that form. Um, when when and how was the decision made to – I mean, parks exist in so many uh, types and forms. What what decision or thought process went into making it a natural preserve? 27 years ago, I don't know that that was trendy enough for most people to think that way. You know, the, you think a park where you just want open space or, or athletic fields. What What was the thinking behind having it be natural? Hmm. Well, those that lived on Harrison Road that started all this are, were actually very avid gardeners. Some, um, the first president actually was born in England, so she brought her English garden heritage with her. Um, others are just, they were just concerned about green space. They just, yes, you're right in that the terminology wasn't the same as it is now, but they wanted a space that wasn't going to be yet another construction. Um, of buildings or of businesses or of asphalt. So I just think maybe you could say that they were ahead of their time. Beth, I, another? I, I would definitely say that because I think that's it. I, I think for that time frame, it wasn't very common. Um, and Cynthia, how long have you been involved? I know Beth said since 2013. How long have you been involved with, with Friends of Friends? Oh, so it was formed, we were formed in 1995. I believe I started in 1996, which was when the first Arts in the Park Festival was. Two young, two women who were artists and also gardeners decided, hey, we have this beautiful space. Why don't we have a little arts festival? So they grabbed me as a volunteer for that. And I stayed around for that. And then someone else grabbed me for the committee of whole Arts in the Park, stayed in there for a couple of years. Then I got grabbed for the board. So I really haven't gone away since the very beginning, I kind of come and go, but I was president for eight years on the board for years before that. So for a very, very long time. Yeah, and if, if you don't mind me interjecting, what was your, your background? Uh, well, I guess it's still your background, but, but, yeah. but what was your background and what made you interested in, um, other than the arts in the park thing of becoming more involved? And that's, that's the Beth as well. But Cynthia, why don't you start? Oh, okay. Um, the art I'm, I was trained as an artist. I have a master's in printmaking. So the art questions always bring me into any situation. And I also come from a gardening family. My uh, grandfather used to exhibit at the Philadelphia Flower Show. So I just find sometimes easier to talk to plants <laughs> than people. Um, so I am very comfortable with plants. I find them amazing. Um, and so I just Yes, it's a very, it's my, my happy place. I call the park my happy place. It's where I can be peaceful or where I can be energetic or watch things grow. Awesome. Beth, how about you? So like Cynthia, I would say uh, I prefer plants to people. I grew up on a series of leased farms as a child and had always been very interested in natural areas. And my background is in soil science. I have a master's degree in soil science from UC Davis and a master's degree in sustainable engineering from Villanova, where I studied water resources in international settings. And uh, I, while I love plants and I love the beauty of plants, I don't approach them so much from the aesthetic point of view. I really am interested their engineering capabilities and the way that they function in ecosystems. And so high school park uh, had a committee called PRAM, which is park restoration and management that was made up of people who were interested in the, the ecosystems in the park and trying to make the best decisions about how to plant and restore and maintain the natural areas. Because there was a lot of enthusiasm, but not a, a real depth of scientific knowledge in other volunteer 
parts of the park. But this committee kind of pulled together the people who had some knowledge and interest and expertise in native plants and plantings and restoration. And they didn't have anyone who knew anything about soil. So one of the PRAM committee members came to me because they had some pH issues from the fact that it was a building that had been imploded directly into the ground and then covered up with some construction fill. So obviously they had some, some pH issues from that um, concrete that was still sitting and is still sitting in the soil. And of course that affects nutrient availability and metals and how you manage and plant and select. So that's how I was first brought into the PRAM committee and then ultimately became part of the full board and remained on the PRAM committee, became vice president. And now I no longer live in Elkins Park, but I do have a great love for the park and the work that Cynthia is doing there. So I remain on the PRAM committee in an advisory capacity. I'm so glad you brought that up because we maintain all the time that soil is one of the most important, you know, plants are important, but without the right soil, mm -hmm. none of that really exists. So I was actually going to ask about having it been a former site of a school and having it caught on fire and then implode it, what kind of effects, I, I didn't know if any remediation had to be done um, or how it affected your overall soils in certain areas, if, if that was a big challenge in, in recreating a natural environment there. Not only has it been a challenge, but it continues to be a challenge. Um, Beth obviously has been my mentor for years and years. And I've learned a lot from her and also from another woman, Diane Eric, who runs Collins Nursery, which is a native plant nursery in the area. Diane so, is a um, person. We love Diane. Yes. Um, and so, yes, um, the implosion of the school into the basement, that's why we have a meadow where the, the largest destruction was, because there's only about 10 to 12 inches of soil on top of the destroyed school and that's why the meadow was there because of the root systems of of the meadow plants um, the other construction that was done more recently within five years there was a sewer that needed to go right through the uh, lower woodlands from road one road to reach the other and they had to um, dig a trench eight uh, 20 feet deep and 18 feet wide in order to replace the sewer that was damaged and actually was running through the creek that's a whole other story but anyway so they're digging um and blowing things up with dynamite down along the woodlands what do you do with all that dirt and rock well you dig it up and you throw it not on the stream side obviously because you're trying to stave the stream you throw it up on the hillside which is our our um beginning of the woodlands so all of the uh, invasive seed bank came with it so now we have a huge invasive problem of Japanese knotweed, which was along the stream bank, which was one issue. It's now on the other side and it's encroaching on the meadow. So that's a problem with the soil <laughs> that um, we're trying to deal with. Haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, the, when they made the rain garden on the side of the meadow, they had to dig obviously the trenches for the huge skeletal system that they put down again they stirred up the soil as Beth will comment on and made a mess of things. So within the rain garden, which was beautifully planted three years ago, I'm constantly uh, pulling mugwort and uh, what else is in there? Crown vetch, all sorts of invasives that are taking over the rain garden. So that demolition created a problem with the soil. Beth, and what other things can you think of? I would just say that there are two main effects of having the anthropogenic inputs that came for the park. And one is, you know, the actual physical and biological management of what plants are there based on the fact that it's a highly disturbed soil and that none of it is native to that area. If you look at the soil series in, uh, in parts of Southeastern Pennsylvania, you'll see that we don't even actually have official soil series because there's so much construction and infill and disturbance since the 1600s that none of the original soil is really 
present in many places because it's just no longer intact. So I don't think that's unique to the park. You know, there are lots of places in the Philadelphia area where you dig a couple of feet and you find a building or a stone wall. And, you know, it, it, it has had pH issues. It's had a little bit of issues with stability because the way that the hydrology works is if you have a big wall in there, it changes the way water moves underneath whatever is on the surface. But the secondary issue is that people have really big expectations around restoration and native plants. Mm -hmm. And of course they should have those big expectations, but there are so many challenges and constraints that we all face. And so people feel that they will save a piece of land and it will be restored to a beautiful pristine meadow, which is always the meadow that they picture from, you know, someplace in Illinois uh, 200 years ago. But we didn't really have those prairies here in Southeastern <laughs> Yeah. Anytime. And the land that we're looking at, like High School Park, you can look at the history of those buildings. But prior to that, it was a farm. So this wow. is everything. You know, it's it's those agricultural remnants. It's the weeds that came along with agricultural production. It's also whatever was put in those gardens and areas surrounding the, the buildings that came after. So you're looking at people who want this beautiful, pristine restoration, but the land is giving you what it has been you know, handed for the last 300 years. So there's a lot of uh, need to do expectation management about <laughs> what a meadow looks like and how much time and effort and possibly herbicide is going to go into that because people really want to, and I understand why, they want to have these beautiful organic lands that look filled with flowers and always pristine and perfect, but that is very hard to achieve and it's very hard to achieve with just physical management without a massive staff. So that's, I guess, the secondary issue of having all of that stuff. And let's be the honest. Maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you mentioned uh, meadow and, and being in the Northeast, traditionally the Northeast with the amount of rainfall mm -hmm. we get, you don't see a lot of meadows. It wants to be mm -hmm. a forest, um, and especially with the amount of rainfall we've been getting this year. It's, it's, it's been crazy. But even as an agricultural piece, you know that that land has been altered over time. Anyway, if you have a stream going through the park, more than likely it's probably been altered from its original fluvial path. Yes. So I would imagine yeah. – that that's an issue too. I'm sure there's a, a good seed bank somewhere on that property. <laughs> if you were to get that, <laughs> that, that stream back to where it originally was, you would see some of those plants come back up. But I, it, the funny thing was, I was going to ask you what the land was prior to it being a school. Um, a farm. An yep. orchard or a farm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, that, that really poses some unique challenges because you're not dealing with original soil. You're not dealing with original conditions and, and the outliers surrounding it are far from original, uh, especially with pressure. Um, so, go so going back to 1995, how did they get started? Like um, they formed this group. They say, this is what we want to do. Well, what was the first step? It looks like Cynthia may be froze. I was say, I think Cynthia I still froze. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're waiting for her to come back, um, I can answer some of those questions. I wasn't uh, in high school park during those early years, but I've gone through the records pretty substantially. And there have been many iterations of what was going to happen in the park because there were a lot of gardeners, but there wasn't at that time a really big depth of knowledge about native plant communities and what they mean. So initially there were a lot of people with individual plots and they also reached out to consultants who would put together a plan for that restoration. But one of the, the questions I think that has had to be answered and re-answered over the 27 years, as you can imagine, is what does restoration mean? What does restoration look like? And what are we restoring it to? Because there are so many layers and levels of development and land use that exist on that plot of land. And there are so many hopes and dreams and plans that people may make that may not be supported by the land. So I think initially there were um, some attempts to, to plant these individual gardens. And I know that the meadow was a very important piece of it, but that has had to be redone several times because 
plant selections have been an issue. Uh, you know, people tend to gravitate toward flowers, but when you're looking at survivability, uh, switchgrass, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that survives everywhere. Uh, grasses and sedges, I think, are the un heroes of meadow plantings, but uh, sunflowers and beautiful purples and reds and yellows are what people want to see. So I think that original plan where they started with gardens and plots and um, getting community members to come in and do those activities have evolved over the years into, I think I would describe our philosophy, a philosophy that I have very much tried to promote as let the land tell us what it will support. And right to um, to do the plantings that people want, but our focus has been, and I think Cynthia would agree with this, but please disagree if not, is that we we plant what the land can sustain, and then we plant pockets of what uh, we like to call eye candy in highly visible areas. Um, we put those things on the outermost edges. We put them in, in areas where they can be tall and be seen from the exterior. So the people do feel the gratification of seeing those beautiful rich colors and shapes and, of the flowers, but they also have the supporting structure of those grasses and sedges and shrubs that are really doing a lot of lifting to maintain the soil and prevent erosion and clean the creek that lies underneath that area. Yeah. So, uh, Cynthia, I was not around in the 1990s when the original group was there, so I tried to explain my understanding from the research I did through the history, but maybe you want to chime in with your remember uh, experiences. A little bit. I'm, my apologies. My computer froze, so I've had to go to my phone, so I missed many um, things that you've said, and I'm trying to figure out how to turn my um, video on, so I'm very sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, Tom was asking, like, where did where where did it start? Like, once yeah, what you was formed, like the, the once the group was formed? What was that first step in achieving that that goal? Um, I think the goals have changed since 1995. I really think the beginning people wanted, as Beth was just referring to, um, pretty wildflowers. The first garden that the volunteers planted simply was a wildflower garden without necessarily a complete understanding of what wildflowers should grow on that hillside. So I think the educational part of native plants grew over the years. Um, the, so that was the very first project. The meadow was a project that the Cheltenham Township got a very large DCNR grant to do. So it was more, hi, friends of High School Park, would you like a meadow? Okay, sure. So <laughs> they gave us the, uh, the grant. They came in. They did. Um, they didn't do as many as many soil tests as I think Beth or nor I think they should have done because a lot, as she referred to before, a lot of plantings were not the appropriate plantings for the meadow. So that it has been replanted three times with each time with more appropriate native seeds and plants. Not sure that answered the question. Did I get to the answer? No, I think that's great. Knowing knowing that it's changed over time, as it should, mm -hmm. um, is do you have a, a a succinct mission statement for Friends of High School Park? Um, yes, there is a, a mission statement that's on the website, basically saying that um, we are eleven acres and we are re uh, stewards of the park and we are responsible for keeping the park up. I'm being general because I now have to walk back to actually get the wording, but it's to enhance the, enhance the park for the betterment and enjoyment of the community and to edge my part and best part. We really want to educate the community about the environment, about ecology, about what they can do in, in small um, gardens at their home. We have a backyard native garden that I got a second grant for last year that was replanted with signage saying, this is what you could plant in your own backyard if you have this type of soil, if you have that type of sun or shade. So that's an educational element. And we've applied for a grant to do a sun native perennial demonstration garden opposite from the shade garden. So we're hoping to, to do that. I think there are, um, oh, here's the actual mission statement to create, manage and preserve um, and viable 11 acre native ecosystem for the enjoyment and education of the community. 
That's our mission, one sentence mission statement. Um, I would like to see more education and more emphasis on education for the park, as would Beth. She can clap or chime in on that one too. <laughs> we, we feel Go education ahead. is such an important yeah. aspect only because it's great if you have this wonderful area, but if no one understands what that area is or what it's doing, it, it gets lost. They may know that they enjoy it, but they may not know why they enjoy it or mm -hmm. that. A natural space doesn't have to be somewhere you go. It could be in your own backyard. So it's, I think, you know, what are some of the other edu educational aspects that that Friends of High School Park actually partake in for, for the park? Well, we have great signage throughout the park on all the gardens. And then um, there is me, actually. I'm in the park five <laughs> to six hours a day. <laughs> and I talk to the people and I say, hey, do you know about this plant or go over there so that you can smell the fringe trees? So I'm, I'm kind of a walking educational system and I get fed by Beth and Diane and I'm learning. And so a person on site at all times when people are walking their dog or, or having a celebration, I think is really a key thing. So. Do you ever have, uh, have people walk into the park who like, you start to see them maybe walk a little faster when you're coming up. Ooh, here comes <laughs> the crazy no. plant lady. I'm just, I'm just joking around. Yeah. I, I hide my big shears when I walk after people. So. No, that's a really important thing because signage works. Um, but a lot of people don't stop to read the sign and then they don't always understand. The, they might even just see the big title at the top saying, oh, this is a, a pollinator meadow, but they don't understand what's good and, and bad in that meadow. And uh, I've been to many places where the meadow isn't managed and then you have a bunch of invasives coming through and, um, and they might, un, un, someone who doesn't understand the plants might look at it and say, oh, look at all these beautiful flowers, not realizing it's a bunch of purple loose stripe or all this other mm -hmm. stuff and think it's something good. But, but I love well, it. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Well, we, we have learned to embrace mugwort and porcelain berry in a, in a kind of a sentimental way because they are pretty amazing plants, even though they are invasive. But the, the workday weekends that I offer every other weekend from March to November are um, a good educational component also. And then I can, while we're working and pulling the porcelain berry or, or cutting the mugwort, mm -hmm. I can tell them about the plants and things like that. You, you Which know. is really, really yeah. important to have that that reinforcement of, for people who might not read the sign or might not have understood mm -hmm. the sign completely. But I think the fact that Cynthia is there is yeah. such an important aspect. When when you go to so many natural spaces, people want to feel that they're by themselves or alone, and they mm -hmm. don't want to see people or they don't want to necessarily have interaction. But interaction brings a sense of community that you don't get without it. And, it and a perfect example my my 21 year old son so i just moved in the last week from the country to a development and my son came home last night he was out on a one wheel which is like a motorized skateboard and he came back and he was like i just talked to two people like in, in the neighborhood <laughs> like because it was so novel because yeah. living where we live yeah. you, didn't, you didn't see people you didn't really communicate and he had two conversations and was so thrilled that all of a sudden this just came like it it gave him a new meaning to where we live now like mm -hmm. it wasn't just a new house it was a community that he started to feel a part of doing that oh, and interacting nice. with everyone makes it feel as if they're part of that community yeah. that they don't necessarily get just walk you may feel at one with nature but you may not have the same connection so i i really appreciate and love your interaction that way cynthia because it's it that definitely gives you a different feel than I think most natural areas. Mm -hmm. We also have um, two big fundraisers, one of which is actually in the park. Arts in the Park is usually the first Sunday in June and has been that way for 25 years. We've missed the last two. Um, but this year we are going to have it in, in October and it's, it's going to be called Parktoberfest, kind of a cute little name, but the park is filled with musicians and um, crafts people and um, plants. I'll bring out the seeds that we've collected and the plants that I've, the native plants that I've been growing and there'll be food vendors. So it's a wonderful day. Obviously it's gonna be smaller this year than usual, um, but that's a great that's a great fundraiser and again 
then the entire board for Friends of High School Park is present and they're talking to the people as they walk around or there's a booth set up for membership. And again, you can get the, the five minute cocktail speech on what we are and hopefully people join that way. Um, it's interesting for me in, in those big fundraisers in the park, when people come in, we don't have an admission charge or anything like that. We just ask for donations. But most people who have never been to the park before think we are all township employees and it's run by the township. So that's, that's a hard thing to get across. No, we are a very small two employee organization with lots of energetic volunteers. So. Wow. That's, that's that two employees just keep yeah, part time part what time you, yeah part. what you're <laughs> able to accomplish that is uh -huh. phenomenal what, that actually brings up a, another question i was just thinking of when you talked about fundraising is well your your friends group is primarily volunteers but not all volunteers and then um and so you're volunteering a lot of your own time your own money but some of this stuff can get a little expensive you need to do something where it's a, a earth moving project or you need to buy plants or you need to that takes a Wait. fair amount of money to do um how how grants you, I, I guess yeah years years like last year how do you accomplish those fundraising goals well um we did a a virtual uh, winter warm up. That's our second fundraiser. That's usually in the winter when we gather and drink a lot and make a lot of food and everybody dances. It's a very fun one. And we have a silent auction. We couldn't, we couldn't do that um, in person this year. So we did it online. And surprisingly enough, we almost reached our regular goal wow. of fundraising, because people came online and, and everyone just gathered together, we prepared little treat bags with food that people could drive by and pick up and then they go home and they do the drinking at home and watch us on that. So that was a, that was a fun, we're a very creative group, our, our board, I think, and volunteers. We come up with interesting ideas. Um, yes. I like also- The cocktail idea uh, you should mention, Cynthia, because I thought oh, that, that was really clever that was and very really fun. connected. <laughs> Back to elderberries. Um, so I have a friend who is a chef and his most recent enterprise is, is as a book of cocktails. So, I gathered elderberry syrups. I didn't want to be responsible for poisoning anybody. So I got the syrups that were already made. We had a, um, we orchestrated a cocktail, a video cocktail party where Andy created all these drinks from plants that you, native plants that you would find in the park. Mm -hmm. That was really exciting. And you'd buy a ticket and I get a little gift bag of the syrup and some recipes and some seeds and, um, huge fundraising effort there. And that project enabled us to um, hire a herd of goats to come to the park to eat down a horrible area that I couldn't weed all by myself, which was another fundraiser that I hadn't even planned on. People love the goats so much, they just kept throwing money at us. So <laughs> that was a good one too. <laughs> right, that was a great community event mid COVID and yeah. people were just packed, you know, coming at, um, staggered times and it was people could be outdoors they were in the park and the goats were the the biggest thing going <laughs> yep <laughs> but what a great resource to be able to use to help to, to help some of those areas that that is wonderful yeah and that's a really creative way to do it is we've talked to many organizations that they all their fundraising was done through in-person events and uh, and they really struggled once you took that away uh, mm -hmm. because they didn't have any other ways to, to make money and these things cost a lot of money so what are some of the other things that the, your fundraising goes to uh buying buying of plants um they well let's see the fundraising is go well the goats enabled us to have the hillside cleared so that we could then pl apply for a grant to do the um, Sun Perennial Native Backyard Demonstration Garden. But any money that people bring to us really is for salaries and for the park maintenance. And we do, I have a very small budget for outside landscapers to help me with pruning of trees that I can't reach and things like that. So some of the money does go for that. And publications, we don't really we send out flyers sometimes, we make posters sometimes, we have a big area in the front of the park 
that we make a, um, a banner talking about what's happening in the park. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, or no, two years running because of COVID in the summertime, we've had a series of art installations um, done within the park, within the meadow, within the trees, wonderful ecologically, environmentally based art installations. Sorry about the helicopter. Um, and this year, because people have been donating so, um, we were able to pay the artists. So. Oh, fantastic. oh that's wonderful. Yeah. That, that is wonderful. Um, you mentioned earlier, just before I forget, that it's a three ecosystem park. Could you elaborate on that? Sure, I'm going to bring Beth in for that because she's going to talk about soil again. Okay, perfect. So are have, you there? Yeah. Oh yeah. You want to go ahead and do an intro, uh, Cynthia? And then nope. Nope. Go ahead. You got it. Okay. So um, we have uh, the meadow area, and we have the woodland edge, which is sort of the transitional area between um, the upper part of the park and the creek below, and then we have the the creek area that's at the base. So we have very different uh, ecosystems in all of those. And again, it is really small fragments, so difficult to manage all of those together. I would say that we haven't spent as much time on the creek portion as we could have or should have. And a lot of that is because we have been in this uh, period of limbo when the town was working on pipes for uh, the water in the township and the timeline for that was really not within our control. So we recently had, as Cynthia mentioned, a lot of earth moving equipment down there and we've been trying to do some planting of trees, but that is gonna need, I think a second round because some of those were planted a little more closely together than possibly they should have been and not all of them have survived. So I think that's gonna take some more thinking. Uh, we've long had an interest in um, doing some increased vegetation or revegetation of the slope between the upper part of the park and the creek, which obviously would have uh, benefits for reducing erosion and benefits for wildlife because you're probably aware in southeastern Pennsylvania there are lots of areas where the understory portions are really missing or impoverished um, because of years of poor management or not really thinking about the future of those areas. And again, it's small, but for an area that's very built up like this, it's really critical, especially because you have this transitional area between the upper meadow, the park where people are uh, very much active in walking their dogs and playing sports and hanging out as families. And above that, there's also a parking lot area. So there is a stormwater component because we really um, do kind of butt up against the city of Philadelphia. So it's a suburb, but it's really an urban almost environment in terms of the density. So managing the three areas, I think budgetarily is pretty intense to try to allocate money to all of them. So I think that's one of the, um, the priorities probably that should be considered moving forward is that uh, upper flat area where people tend to congregate has gotten a lot of attention. And uh, it looks really great. I think Cynthia has done a great job of like curating and stewarding all of those plants and garden areas, uh, especially given the challenges of the last two years. But it would be great to turn more attention to the other two ecosystems within the park because it, it'd be great to have everything sort of in balance and um, you know finding the resources for that and especially you know the physical labor to do that can be a little bit of a challenge, especially now that we aren't it's kind of not clear whether or not we're going to be able to bring in large groups who do, you know, like a mass planting um, or mass restoration work. But, you know, we can hope to do that, maybe do some live staking down along the creek now that the construction has been finished, because we do have some unvegetated sloping areas that would probably benefit from live staking. And we have enough plant material within the park, I think, um, that could serve as a live state nursery, or even that we could put one in to, to try to have at least a small area where we can harvest those twigs for live staking. Right, we are starting the nursery um, this fall of from seeds from pinelands, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and seeds that I've collected, um, but for plants, but the, the stick, the twig idea is a good section for another area in the park. They, um, the, uh, another problem with the, the lower woodlands 
from all of the construction and everything is that they, in order to do the sewage line, they took down mm, an enormous number of huge trees. It was really a forest down there. Mm -hmm. And they, they took them down and then did the sewer and then planted new trees right within the first year, which may not have been the best plan because the roots and everything hadn't settled from the trees that had been taken down and things are rotting and it's very soupy down there. So that's another problem. I'm waiting to see how everything settles out before we invest too much on the lower woodlands themselves. The stream bank is a really good idea, but the lower woodlands are still in some sort of an evolution that I don't quite understand what's gonna happen in another year. You, we've definitely outlined some challenges mm -hmm. that, that you've had uh, from the beginning and moving forward, uh, you know, soil from from what the land was beforehand. You did mention invasive plant pressure from uh, yes. seed pen, seed banks getting disturbed. What are what are some of the way knowing that you're a two you're a volunteer uh, uh, organization and only two employees? How do you handle invasive plant pressure? Um, I'm I'm assuming. <laughs> That that's that's a difficult one that that's never ending. Um, what are some of the ways you go about handling that pressure? Well, um, in terms of the meadow, I'm not I'm not pro chemical, um, but in the meadow, it really is necessary since there have been so many disturbances of the soil and things planted and not successful and planted again. That the meadow is the only place that I hire. We zinc actually to come once or twice a year to do spot spraying. They had done a, um, a complete broadcast spraying a couple of years back and we started again. So they're keeping an eye on the weeds there. Uh, the rain garden is overrun with mugwort and crown vetch. And that simply is a volunteer maintenance program. I have a good number of, of people that come and they just plant themselves in the, in the rain garden and they cut and they pull, but it really is just, you have to take a deep breath and acknowledge that we are a very small organization and we're trying our best. And yes, there's some mugwort over there, but there wasn't over, you know, there was there last year and it's not there this year. So it's, uh, the Japanese knotweed is gonna be another chemical annihilation, I think, but the Japanese knotweed because of the land disturbance is all mixed in with good things that we want. So it's a, gonna be a, the question of me cutting and painting and cutting and painting and cutting and painting. Um, the, go ahead. None of us are fans of, of having to use chemicals, but we do acknowledge that it is a tool in the toolbox that you spare right. correctly. It's, it's important because without it, without it, we couldn't do what we do as a nursery. We, we'd be out of business if, if we tried to mm -hmm. not use it at all. So we're not fans, but you're always trying to limit that footprint. And so I appreciate it, that, that approach. And that's if I were to, okay. you know, those early, um, those early activists and enthusiasts for the park really had strong feelings about not using anything that was unnatural within the park. And I think there's a little bit of tension around that still, I think, in every community where people really want to move forward with what they perceive as natural methods. But realistically, we had to use glyphosate to eliminate that first weed bank several times as part of this strategy for being able to successfully establish the new meadow. And then we had several uh, outbreaks of large areas of crown vetch and, and crown vetch, you know, it's, it's a legume, it's tap rooted, it's fixing its own nitrogen. So without using clopyrrolid, we were not very uh, successful at eliminating it. And so we try to be strategic. We try to be very targeted and very limited in what we use, but you know, there is that education piece to say it, the only way that we would be able to successfully manage all of those mechanically with the staff that we have and with even the volunteer force that we have would be if we were out there every single day with a dozen people. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, it's, it's a disappointment. I think all of us in the plant community are disappointed that that does need to be a tool in the toolbox. But given the resource availability that we have, that's our best option. And, and, you know, we've done a great job, I think, with just the mechanical stuff. Um, one of the things that I try to encourage, so I'd like to fit that in, that um, I try to discourage lots of pulling. Uh, don't, I don't mind pulling with things like, um, like switchgrass, where it's very, or not switchgrass, um, 
With silt grass, where it's very close to the surface and not deep rooted, it's an annual and easy to pull out. But lots of the other things that are deep rooted and they have extensive root systems, I really discourage people from pulling because you know you see what happens to the soil structure when you're pulling out these large masses of roots, and you're also really exposing all of that soil seed bank to lovely conditions that will make them sprout. So it sometimes you end up with 10 in place of the one that you pulled. So really cutting just below the soil surface is a great strategy for many of those, even the things like porcelain berry, because otherwise you're pulling up large segments of soil. And I know it can be disheartening when you see sometimes how much work may need to be done, but we've been talking with a lot of land managers that really, you know, really preach patience. It, it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a year or maybe two years. It might take five, 10 years, mm -hmm. but as long as you're making an improvement every year, that's what's important. And over time, you'll, you'll start to, to see those rewards. It's just, we all get impatient. We all want it to be an oasis immediately. And it's, and sometimes you do the wrong things when, when you expect those types of results. Yes. So, and but, that, that's where the good signage comes in too, because the meadow just being replanted again last year, people commented this, um, to me that, oh, it's all lavender this year. What happened to the other colors? And I said, well, wait until next year, you'll get lavender and yellow. And then next year you'll get lavender, yellow and red. And so it's, it's an educational process to help them be more patient and wait for the next growing season, I think. So and sometimes one, we can tell them to just step back 10 feet and squint a little and look for the yellow <laughs> or a reality that is going to be with us. We're not going to eradicate them. We're going to manage them. We're going to keep them in check and, and hopefully have more of the good stuff that we do want, but we are going to have to accept that they are part of the landscape and we can't anticipate having a hundred percent eradication. And that's an right. education as well. I agree. How, how about deer pressure? Is that, is that an issue for you at the park? Um, there are a few deer um, that yep. come through and I cage the trees and shrubs that need caging when they get ready, when the deer get ready to rub. But I, we have not completely lost things to deer because there aren't really that many and okay. they eat their, their menu of what they like to eat, but there's so much that the ground, they share with the groundhogs who share with the foxes who share with the snakes. I mean, it's, a, we're a small a small animal community, I guess. Well, I, healthy, we do not have a problem. <laughs> but that's great. A healthy, you know, you want a healthy community, not an unhealthy yep. community. So having some, but not a hundred per per square yeah. mile. That's, I mean, that's wonderful. That's what you want. You you want a balanced ecosystem. So it's it's really nice to hear that. That well, since, also sorry, every other year, the every other year the township, um, Cheltenham Township and or Abington Township do a kill. So they do a bow and arrow shooting to keep the deer population down in the residential communities. So maybe that helps the park keep the communities down too, the numbers down, I'm not sure. So we, we've talked about challenges, but I, I always love to focus more on the reward. So since <laughs> the creation of, of High School Park and, and, and working on all these challenges and, and working towards this mission and this goal, what are some of the surprises that you've seen appear in the park? Like, is there wildlife that maybe you didn't expect to see or, or a bird community that had been absent that now you're starting to see a, a larger community of? Hmm. Good question. I know it was written down. Um, but there, I love seeing the blue heron fly over the meadow. There's a blue heron that lives down by the creek and he or she has been here for a very long time. I never see more than one. There's a bald eagle that flies in every once in a while. I don't know that the, there are so many songbirds this year. I guess if I were to say something that increased, it would be the songbirds and the butterflies. The monarchs are back and the swallowtails. There, we have so many plants that, that you just see the meadow and it's dancing with butterflies, which is wonderful. And songbirds like it here, which I'm very happy with, especially with the, whatever the virus disease thing is that's going around this area, killing off the songbirds. They're all coming here and they seem healthy. That is why I, I love hearing that, you know, that, you know, we always, you know, you always want to know what the challenges are because everyone's encountering the same challenges and they want to know how other people are handling it and how you work through them. But it's all about the, the rewards of getting through that. And, and, if, if you have a larger amount of people that are enjoying that facility and, and knowing what it is and what it does and wanting to be a part of it, like has, has your volunteer base changed over time? Have you seen a larger increase in the amount of people that want to be involved? Well, 
Um, oddly enough, it, it seems to stay around 10 people a workday. Okay. But this, these past two COVID years, that has remained the same. People still come because you can be outside and I can shout over to you six feet away. I mean, it's, it's great. So people, it has not dropped off during these COVID years. Oh, that's no. impressive. That really is. Even if you maintain 10 people a day, I'm sure it's not the same 10 people every day. So that's, you have a big enough pool to be able to maintain that. It's pretty, pretty awesome. So, well, yeah, it's only on the weekends. It's only every other weekend, but yeah, it's still great. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the beer runners to get back organized because they're a, a running group, <laughs> a, a wonderful, a wonderful group of people who run to a pub and drink. But um, they also come and help in the park with a big heavy loading, like the, the woodlands. They spread the wood chips for us. So I'm looking forward to that group of 25 coming back soon. That sounds like my yeah. kind of my <laughs> kind of group. It's kind I of group, good. Right? Yeah, I could. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I could do that kind of running. Easy. That's that, that's a good incentive. Um, what what is your favorite part of of being involved in Friends of High School Park? Um, what what it's you know you wake up what what is that driving force that makes you feel so good that that you've been able to do this oh, that i've been able to do this at 65 starting this now um <laughs> i i just love the park i just i go and i i enjoy being here and it's very peaceful to me and i i look at the plants and i say well oh no i have to research this because it doesn't look too well it's a constant nudge in me to grow and to learn and um so I guess that's what makes me happiest. Beth, how about yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I uh, researched the, I guess the background of the park a couple of years ago as we were heading into the 25th year. So um, that gave me a really new perspective on the park since I wasn't there in the early days. So when I am in the park, which is less frequent now, unfortunately, I look around and I am awed that it exists because when you look at those early documents, there was development that was going to happen there. And this is a story of when the community wins. And not only did the community win, but we're almost 30 years out and it is still this passive native plant park in the middle of a township that serves so many people from across lots of demographics. And this is the kind of stuff people make movies about, you know, <laughs> come in and, and the community, you know, rallies together to save it. That really happened. And lots of people don't remember those early days. I didn't because I wasn't around. And I, I wish people remembered that the amazing win and victory that this is and that how critical a place like this is to a community. It's not just nice to have. Right. If you breathe air and drink water, you care. Yeah. <laughs> in your town. So for me, that's the joy of the park. So I, I know that the township owns the land, but the Friends of Hopewell, or I'm sorry, the Friends of I'm I'm confusing Friends yeah. groups. Yeah. Friends High of School Park. park. <laughs> um, does how what what part does the township play in all of this? Do they mm -hmm. actually offer help or offer money at, at some time and can they pull the rug out from under you I, that was going to be my point, next yeah. question yeah um do they offer help yes there's a large area um of lawn that's the main gathering place they mow that um for me uh once a week or once every other week um and when trees fall, if I can't carry them out, they come and they help. Um, after those last two storms, we lost a number of big ones. And so we're I'm scheduling some arborists to come in. We're not paying for it. The township is taking care of that. Um, and the guys in on the workday weekends, we get a lot of invasives pulled out. And I have some compost bins, but I don't have a lot. They'll come and take that stuff away for, for us. And it's a, nice, a wonderful relationship I have with a um, two directors, Bob Dominic and Chris Cool, as part of the township. They come and they chat. They love the park. I'm. I think the township is very lucky to have those two gentlemen in charge of outdoors because they do appreciate the environment and ecology. And they ask me questions. I ask them questions. So it's a very good relationship. And every once in a while, I bake them a cheesecake to keep them on my good size side. So. Um, as far as pulling the rug out from under us, no, I, I can't. What would happen, but could it happen? Um, 
they would throw us off the land. I, I, I can't imagine that happening. I can't imagine them wanting to happen because the remark that the commissioners and the township officials offer most to us is, oh my goodness, we couldn't do this without you. You are maintaining this that we don't have time to do, so. And they're reconsidering their stormwater fees and stormwater infrastructure. So I think it would be really hard to have reasons to change the land use patterns in that area that is really so important. Well, they, they yeah. get a park without, with very minimally being involved in it, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is they have stewards that are volunteering their time and fundraising money to take care of it. And they get to reap the yep. benefits of that. So that is a wonderful. Oh, they're surprise. very happy for us to pay for things. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so oh, we, we always, Tom, did you have I, another question? I did have one okay. and that's like, I let off with, there's a lot of people who have been asking us, how can I do this kind of stuff um, in my own area? And, um, and I guess our first piece of advice was, well, look and make sure that there isn't one of these groups already, because then if there is, then you go and join that group. But uh, if someone wanted to to start something like this or join a group like that, what kind of advice would you give them uh, wherever they live? I would think the first thing they need to do, well, the first thing is what you said, check around, see if there's a friends group. And if there's not, then go to the township officials. Each township is different. We have commissioners that run the township and then have their staff. So these guys, the original guys went to the township commissioners and started a conversation. Obviously, the, I, I think you were meaning on public land. How do we start a friends group on a public land? So you do have to go through the township officials of wherever you are, but come in with all of your, the huge shoebox of ideas that you have and then offer it to the uh, township officials but then think really small and start small and start with one thing. There's a new group that's forming in Cheltenham Township for another Arboretum on the other side of town and wonderful ideas, wonderful energy. And they asked us for advice. And that's the thing I kept saying over and over to them. Do not do 147 things at the same time. Do one thing, do it well, and then do a second thing. That's great advice. That's, yeah, I that's... was, was going to say the same. That's like, I don't think there would be a worse way to to or cause more displeasure with that township committee or or, or those people than to come in and do all this stuff and move a whole bunch of stuff and then just kind of when they show up it doesn't look great. You want to have yeah. Paul wins, hey, this is what we're trying to do all over the place. Look how nice this is. We're gonna do it everywhere. So, yes, yeah. I'm sure. And it's really critical. I'm sorry, guys. It's really critical to know, as um, all of you have mentioned, what's already happening in a place, because there may not be a friends group, but there may be an informal group that's already doing something. And it's better to connect with some kind of existing structure and find out what they're doing first. And um, PA Parks and Forests, they have a really good um, presentation online that you can just look up. It's like paparksandforest.org, I think. And they have a really nice presentation about how to go about finding uh, and forming a friends group. You know, it's really stepwise about uh, how to come up with a mission and how to identify people and, and where to go next and, you know, whether or not you want to become a nonprofit and how that can be beneficial in getting donations and in also having credibility with people. So I think that's a really good resource because uh, sometimes it seems overwhelming, like, oh, how do I do this? But they really have it down stepwise. And I think that's a helpful resource. That's wonderful. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Cynthia. I was going to say, and once you have formed your new group in the area that you want, make sure you are always present in the um, eyes and ears of the township officials. I go before them three times a year with a video of what has happened in the park. And the township officials, uh, the commissioners aren't always able to come to the park. So they are very appreciative to know what's going on. And I think you always have to be part of a conversation with the township if you're on township land let them know what you're doing all of the time so and i think it. you you were fortunate to encounter a municipality that was receptive to what was being uh presented and you, not every municipality may have the same approach to that so you may have to be a good advocate you may have to really do your homework and at least be able to make a presentation to sway someone that maybe wants to use that land in another way and you may only if if they're 
you may only get one shot. You may get the green light. So take it small, do it right. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew and, mm -hmm. and make a mess of it. Like when you get that opportunity, make sure you have a plan. You, you start off small and, and work towards that goal. So it's, um, I think it's wonderful what you've been able to accomplish. And, and I look, I have not visited it. I know Noel in our office speaks so highly of it. Mm -hmm. This is, We'll definitely, oh, she's uh, wonderful. I'm so <laughs> glad she found us. <laughs> so I'll, I'll definitely have to make sure we, we hit Parktoberfest. That's, oh, yeah. that's okay. my calendar. Um, we always kind of end this with, with two things. We're, we have one last question, one final question, and then we give everyone a final thought. So our final question is always the same final question. And Cynthia, we'll start with you. What is your favorite native plant? Okay including trees and shrubs plant. Um, yes. The Keonanthus virginicus, the fringe tree. Very nice, very nice choice. I love we that. We have a bunch of them, yeah. This, the, the first time I saw a mature one, it was probably at a, a property off of Germantown Avenue um, on Chestnut Hill. And it was, I just happened to be on that property while it was in full bloom and it just completely blew me away. I, I love that. I love that tree. That's a great choice. Uh, and ben, the smell, the smell, oh. the, the, you're walking through a perfume factory when you walk underneath. It, yeah. Before you, before I even saw it, the smell, it smacked me in the face. So it was, yeah. it was a, a great, great, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that, that moment when I saw that. Beth, how about you? What is your favorite? You know, I just try trying to get me to come up with one thing <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna with two because I care a lot about plant function. All right, wonderful. So I would say my favorite is Baptisia australis because I like the deep roots. I like that it's nitrogen fixer. I think it has really beautiful leaves that tend to be never ratty uh, and it has nice biomass in the summer. Uh, and also Sanguinaria canadensis because because uh, those ephemerals have such an important role and they're really declining because we have all of those invaders that have taken over their time and space. So I guess those are my two favorites. And great choices. Oh, yeah. That's, I love that, you know, and it's with all the podcasts and all the guests, very rarely is there ever any overlap. So I love hearing yeah, I things that have never been. I'm mentioned. not even sure if we've had any overlap, but I know a few people said oaks because yeah. of that's uh, Dr. Tallamy. Doug Tallamy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. fine. So we, we always end the show with a final thought. So we're going to give each person, including Tom and myself, uh, a final minute or two just to we give you the floor. You can use it any way that you want. You can recap. You can promote something. You can touch on something we hadn't hadn't already spoke about. Say but happy birthday. You can say yeah. You can say happy birthday. You can say why Tom is your best friend. But um, that's, we'll, start, we'll start off with you. If if you want to, we'll give you the floor, and you can use it any way you want. Which one of us is the you? Oh, I said Beth. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I apologize. So I will say this. So in my non-Friends of High School Park life, I'm the Master Watershed Steward Coordinator for Philadelphia um, at the State Extension. And what I like about my job is that it incorporates all of the things that are important to me, the soil, the plants, and the water in terms of uh, how they affect communities. So I guess my final thought would be that as a Friends of group, and as a person who is in the sort of restoration and, and natural resource stewardship community, I think we all have to do a great job of closing the loop for people very explicitly because they are not making the connections that your plants and your soil and your water and your air are all one connected pool. And so like as a friends group, for instance, if you only say that your mission is to beautify a location, some people are going to interpret that as mowing and blowing turf. And you want to be really explicit about how all of those things interrelate and affect the lives of the people around them. And that is the end of my thought. That is <laughs> a wonderful thought. thought. Yes. Cynthia, how about you? Well, jumping off of uh, this wonderful thought, I did not read the UN report this week, but I read articles about the UN report that was the most depressed that I've heard a report of the environment and the state of the world. So my important note would be, please read, please educate yourself, please come to native plant places and, and nurseries and gardens and understand that this is where we need to go. We need to understand the environment 
or it won't be around very long. And happy birthday to my grandson, Dylan. Awesome. Awesome. Great thought. Tom, would you like to go or do you want me to go? Uh, I'll, I will go, friend. All right. Uh, You're going to leave gonna me say, go last. I'm, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, it is, it is true that I didn't invite friend to my wedding. That is, um, <laughs> we have a very exclusive guest list of uh, 350 people. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> like I'm not giving you a hard time at all. There's no animosity there. No, it's um, my, my real final thought would be that it's great to get involved. And there's so many like-minded individuals out there that kind of feel alone right now. Um, and Cynthia did a great job bringing up the 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 UN. Uh, it was a climate change report, right? That just came out. Yeah. yeah. And um, and uh, it, it's they actually used the word hopeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a lonely time to like almost be like an ecologist because you know how bad things are looking. And you know how many people don't seem to care at the same time, but there are people like uh, like us that are out there, and it's important to find those people, get involved together, come up with plans together, and at least make your small change and try and convince other people along the way. So. Awesome, that's a great thought. So I make it a little deep, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it. I, I think I think today is another instance where we're just showing you another spoke to the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and and all of these things play a part in the greater good. And you know, we had and, and Tom will laugh at this, we had a friendly disagreement with one of our friends and customers about or I did, maybe not you about I, I was about in how the to, middle. I you, agreed with both sides. Both of you, you know, and it's to me, it's this is someone saying, you know, I, I think a great and I'm not saying this to because he I'll I'll have him on and we can have this yeah. conversation. Also I'm listener. Not, yeah, he's also a listener. <laughs> so this is gonna come but, up. But you know, it it, it was it, he thought it would play a bigger part if native plants were available everywhere you could buy plants. Let, let's just say Lowe's or a Home Depot or a stores, chain yeah. box store. You know, to me, that's that's not the difference. I don't think putting a native plant in between barberry and glyphosate is is making a difference to anyone because they're just walking in and just just because you put it there and they can buy it doesn't make a difference to me. Education and the people that are spreading the right message are what makes a difference. So if you go to a garden center that's preaching all the right things, they're gonna have a greater effect than just presenting someone with a plant. Cause it's more about more than just the plants. It's about the sun's energy. It's about the soil. It's about clean mm -hmm. water. It's about community. It's about making the right choices. So the Friends of High School Park have not only created a great place for you to visit, they've created a community that educates and helps promote it. And hopefully it goes beyond the boundaries of that park, you're taking it home, you're taking it mm -hmm. to your neighbors, and, and you're making a difference that way, because this is an instance where people have made a difference against government, against, uh, you know, just what development, mm -hmm. where, where you can see what can be done, and we need more of that, and it needs to grow beyond that, and you have to keep, mm -hmm. we keep preaching, you have to make the circle bigger, this is one of the ways to make the circle bigger. The podcast is one of the ways to make the circle bigger. So bring someone to, to Friends of High School Park. Bring someone to one of your local natural areas. Talk about it. Have someone listen to the podcast. Leave a review. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you like that segue? Oh, yeah. But it's, I, I just think that these are all great people all working in different ways to do the same thing, and they're all important. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter which one you listen to or become a part of as long as you incorporate it into your life and then you can become a teacher as well that's yeah. what's important and, and beth you actually had a great um point earlier where you said this is the thing that people make movies about and i agree with that if this was, was like you see all the movies where it's, it's about sea turtles or it's about <laughs> dolphins or it's yeah. about uh there's the one about geese which is yeah. all good movies but um yeah they'd make a movie about it it's less so with plants although there is that that Xerxes oh I guess it's about butterflies yeah. the one about the Xerxes yeah. society founder um so it's still about butterflies but it's more about plants than than any of the others but yeah okay well you know, there's a challenge for you we can be yeah. your first subject come make a movie about us <laughs> there you go you know and 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 this is kind of like a a spoiler alert but for the next buzz episode I already have my article chosen and it was a study by the University of Massachusetts saying it's like 1300 known invasive species are still available for sale at local garden centers and nurseries. And it was ones that are even banned in certain states where you can buy it at the neighboring state. But they were saying like, especially like some of the worst 
invasives that you can imagine you can still buy and they're they're readily available oh yeah even with right here in new jersey yeah you know it's, and it's it that's the type of thing that needs to change not just that you can buy a native plant the education about why you shouldn't buy this plant the harm that it does and better choices that you can make um and and that's and really even, how you solve some even of these worse problems. than just being able to buy it, is you have act, people actively campaigning that they should they, be able, they should to, be sell able to sell them and that these are better than than the alternatives yeah so easy that's, care yes that's what we have to <laughs> get over and it's going to take truthfully it's going to take a lot of money and yeah. it's where does that money come from so you know caring isn't necessarily a big business there's no <laughs> there's no lobbyist for caring uh, you know, unless unless you can put money behind it, and some of these companies have a lot at stake. They have a lot of money to mm -hmm. a, at stake, and they can present it to to let uh, to Congress or whatever, just mm -hmm. to make sure they can continue to do these things. Caring that necessarily doesn't trump money, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. But if we band together and you make the education, and people willingly choose not to buy these things, then everyone's going to have yeah. to adapt anyway. Yeah. So. So, and yeah, it gives us so much power on a local level that we don't require the EPA or the president or some great body in the world to do. We can do that ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We can all make the right choice. Yeah. So. so we got a final thought plus some today. Wow. How do you like that? <laughs> but that is it. That well, That's going to wrap it up. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to Thank you. Blackwood and Beth Young. Young. I see. I always screw up last names. It doesn't matter how easy it is. <laughs> That's why I always give you the section. I never have to say uh, it. And they are from Friends of High School Park. Uh, for more information, you can visit their website, which is HTTP. Uh, I never read that part. www.friendsofhighschoolpark.org uh, backslash FHSPW uh, with another backslash there. Is that right? That Dan? sounded really That sounded really weird. It's really just www.fhsp.org. Oh, okay. Okay. I I, I so, copied and pasted it from the web browser. Yeah, say that one more time <laughs> so, so no one gets confused. Yes. <laughs> Cynthia, if you don't mind. www.fhsp.org. Okay. Okay. And um, we don't have social media links in here for you guys too. So if you know those off the top of your head, feel free to list them. If not, we will post them on our, our website. They will go on our website under show notes. Okay. Well, we do do Instagram. I'm not sure. I'm not. Yeah. They had to drag me into the 21st century kicking and screaming. I'm not a social media person. So, well, we will make sure regardless, we have all the links on the website tomorrow. So. Okay, great. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, we're going to give a big thank you to the Ecocentric Plastic Men for contributing our theme music. Uh, make sure not only do you buy or or listen to their songs or wherever you stream or consume music, go see them live. Uh, they are a staple in the Philadelphia music scene. They play a lot in Maniunk. So, you know, they've had a few shows at the Grape Room locally. So make sure you go see them. You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. We have the question and comment line. The number is 215-346-6189. I will repeat that, 215-346-6189. Call in, ask a question, leave a comment. When we play it on a future episode, episode of The Buzz, we'll try to answer it or comment on it for you. Uh, the the feedback has been wonderful uh, on the question and comment line, so keep calling in. And uh, we have the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. We're just a couple members away from hitting the 500 mark. And, man, you guys have been wonderful as far as your feedback and your posts. So everyone's been great, and I, I love – how kind everyone has been in that group as well. We haven't had any issues at no, all. So, no, not at all. Yeah, so we'll keep it going over there. So you can find Friends of High School Park on Instagram at Friends of High School Park. All right, <laughs> so there you go. Way easier than I was expecting. Sometimes there's like <laughs> underscores and backsplashes and all kinds of stuff in there and like symbols, but no, it's just Friends of High School Park on Instagram and they have some great contact up, content up and you'll find more about some of their events on there as well. Awesome. Um, you can buy our Native Plants Healthy Plant t-shirts which we have up in that's on our website. If you just go to www.nativeplantshealthyplant.com. There's a banner across the top that says buy t-shirts here. Click that. It'll take you to our Teespring store. All of the money that, that doesn't go into buying the actual t-shirts is going to groups that we have on the podcast uh, as, as donations. So they can keep doing the great work that they are doing. Um, when, oh, where was I? You can also check us out on, uh, or, this is where I always screw up, friend, too. <laughs> you can listen to... We can switch again if oh, you want. Oh, we might we have switch. to, yeah. 
You can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, really wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us. Um, you can even ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. When you do listen, if you can do us a big favor, uh, leave a five-star review and hit subscribe. It helps more than you can realize. And, it's it's a big, big and thing. And we've gotten a ton of five-star reviews over oh, the yeah. last couple of days. And we, but we, they aren't writing anything. So if you not. write something, we'll read it. But uh, That's true. But if you don't write anything, maybe we, we there's can't nothing share for us to share. Yes. <laughs> so, and the best thing you can do to help us is share this with a friend and uh, and just take their phone and hit subscribe on us. And they give us five star review from their phone. That yeah. that goes a long, long way. Yes. So with that, that's thank how we've you gotten all our all of our reviews. <laughs> yeah. I just keep taking everyone's phone. Yeah. Meetings, like <laughs> trade shows, just taking everyone's <laughs> phone and hit subscribe. But with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom, and I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, coming up next week, we have another episode of the Buzz. And I want to thank uh, Beth and Cynthia again for taking time out of the day. I know this was a, a little bit last minute, but we appreciate you coming on and telling us all about your organization. And we will see everyone next week. Until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.